Hello, and welcome to another Unity tutorial. In this video, we will learn how to make a top-down controller using Unity's new input system, using a character controller for horizontal movement, and utilising Cinemachine, a free package which gives us advanced camera control to make the camera follow the player. If this video helps you, remember to smash like and subscribe, and without further ado, let's get started. Here I have opened a blank 3D project. The new input system is not included in projects by default, so to use it, we will have to go to the package manager via Windows and package manager. Then search for input and install the input system. If you have not downloaded this package before, the button will say download instead. I have already installed the package to save time, so just pause the video and come back when it's done. Once it finishes installing, you will be asked if you want to change the default input handling from the old input system to the new input system, and we do, so click yes, and then wait for the editor to restart. Once it opens up again, we can close the package manager, and you might see this warning here, which tells us that the 32-bit version of Windows is currently not supported. I believe it is safe to ignore this, as I have never had any problems doing so before, but if you want to make it go away, simply go to File, Build Settings, and then change the architecture from times 86 to 86 underscore 64. Just to prove that it works without doing this, I have left it as the default. Now we can start creating our scene, so right click in the hierarchy and create a new 3D object plane. I'll call this the ground. I'll set its scale to 5 on the X and Z to give our player more space to move around. Then select the layers and add a layer. I will call this ground. Select our ground object and assign it the layer we just created. Next we'll create the player. So in the hierarchy, right click and create a new empty object, which I'll call player. To this, I'll add a component, which will be the character controller, and then set its height to three and radius to 0 0.6, just to make it slightly bigger. I'll also set its centre on the Y to 1.5, so it stands on the ground, which we can see if we zoom in. Now on this player, I'll add a capsule object, which will allow us to see it in the game. I'll reset its transform, and then remove the capsule collider, since the character controller deals with all collisions. I'll also set its scale to 1.2 on the X and Z and 1.5 on the Y, so that it fits the collider of the character controller. Finally, I'll position it at 1.5 on the Y, and make sure that it is parented to the player object. Now for the main camera, I'm going to set its position to 0 on the X, 12 on the Y, and negative 7 on the Z, and its rotation to 60 on the X. This gives us a nice top-down feel, but you can of course use any values here that you would like to. I'll also create two new materials in our project, just to better distinguish the player. The first one will be M player, and the second one will be M underscore ground. I will assign the materials respectively to the ground and the player. I'll make the player a slightly reddish colour, and then the ground a slightly greenish colour, just to better distinguish them. With the game objects all in place, let's create a new folder in the project, which I'll call player. Inside of here, we will put all of the movement logic. First, I'll right click and create a new input actions, which we got from the input system package, and call this player controls. I'll select Generate c -sharp Class and then edit the asset. This window may look confusing at first, but it is really quite simple. On the far left, we have Action Maps. These are just large containers in which we can store actions. Actions are defined in the middle and are simply input from the player, such as holding down W or pressing space. On the right, you can see the properties for different actions allowing us to customise them with dead zones, double taps and other cool stuff. To see that in action, let's create a new action map 
and I'll call this ground movement. I'll rename the default action using F2 to horizontal movement, set its action type to pass through, which means continuously listen for input, and then its control type to a vector 2. I'll expand it using the arrow on the side and delete the default binding, then hit the plus and add a 2D vector composite. I'll call this WASD. Now I can assign the up value to W, the down value to S, the left value to A, and the right value to D. All of that tells Unity to continuously listen for any of the keys W, A, S, or D being pressed, and if they are, to update the horizontal movement action. If W is pressed, we will have a vector 2 of 0 on the x and 1 on the y. If A is pressed, we will have a vector 2 of negative 1 on the x and 0 on the y, and so on. Now we can save the asset and close it. You will notice that it automatically generated a new C sharp class for us. Now to move the player, we'll need two more scripts. So I'll right click, create a C sharp script. The first one will be movement, which will be used to make the player move. And the second one, so right click, create C sharp script, will be the input manager. Now I'll select both of these and hit enter to open them up in Visual Studio. For the purposes of this tutorial, I will be using Visual Studio code instead of Visual Studio since it runs faster on my machine, but the scripts will work exactly the same no matter what editor you use. In the input manager script, we will start by setting up the basics of the new input system. We need a reference to our input controls, so I'll start off with a variable type of player controls, and I'll call this controls. Underneath that, I'll have another player controls, but this time dot ground movement actions, and I'll call this ground movement. Now in the awake method, I can set controls is equal to new player controls to initialize it, and then ground movement is equal to controls dot ground movement. When using the new input system, we also have to remember to enable and disable it. So I'll have void on enable, and in here I'll call controls dot enable. I realize that I misspelled it up here. And then I'll do the same to disable it. So void on disable and controls dot disable. Great. With the basics of the input system set up, we can now focus on getting input from the user. To get input, we use the awake method and use the syntax ground movement to call our variable dot and then insert the action and then dot performed plus equals context and then arrow to do something. In this statement, Context is a variable which contains information about the press, and in the do something part, we can call a function or set a variable. To get input from the WASD keys, I'll first create a new variable at the top, which will be vector2, horizontal input, in which we can store the input of the player. Then in the awake function, I'll use the syntax to say ground movement, dot horizontal movement, dot performed plus equals ctx short for context the arrow and then horizontal input is equal to context dot read value and we want to read a value type of vector 2. Great now let's go over to our movement script in which we want to receive the input. To do this I'll create another variable again vector 2 horizontal input and then I'll create a public function which will be void and I'll call this receive input. This will take an input type of vector2 which I'll call input. Now in this function all we have to do is set horizontal input equal to the input of the function. 
And just to check that it's working later, I'll also add print horizontal input. Now we can implement this in the input manager by first getting a reference to our movement script using serialized field movement and I'll just call this movement with a lowercase m. This will allow us to assign the script in the inspector. Now underneath the awake method I'll create a new function this will be void update and inside it all we have to do is say movement dot receive input and I'll pass in the horizontal input. Great, we should be able to return back to the editor now and test it out. I'll select our player and then drag and drop all of these scripts onto it, so the input manager and the movement script. Then remember to assign the movement script to the input manager in its slot. Now if I save and hit play, you will see that nothing much is happening in the game view nor the scene view. But in the console, we can see a vector 2 of 0, 0 being printed to the screen. If I hold down the A key, you can see that the vector 2 being printed is negative 1, 0. Similarly, if I hold down the W key, 0, 1, D key will be 1, 0, and the S key will be 0 and negative 1. Great, with this, we can exit play mode and return back to the movement script. We'll need to declare two more variables up the top which will be character controller, which allows us to move the player, and I'll call this controller. And the second one will be a float, which I'll call speed, and set this to 11 by default. For both of these, I'll also make them serialized fields, just so that we can edit them in the inspector. Next, I'll create the update function, so void update, and inside here, I'll say vector3 horizontal velocity is equal to vector3 dot right multiplied by horizontal input dot x plus vector3 dot forward multiplied by horizontal input dot y. And then we also want to multiply this whole thing by speed. Now I can say controller.move and we want to move by horizontal velocity multiplied by time dot delta time to keep it frame rate independent. I will also remove the print statement as we know that it is working. Now we can return back to the editor to test it, but first remember to assign the scripts to their corresponding slots and then we should be able to hit play. You should see that if I hold down the A key the player moves to the left, same with D, S and W, and of course we have full 8D movement. There are two problems right now that I can think of. Firstly, if I drag the player into the air, you'll see that they don't fall down because we don't have physics acting upon them, and we can actually move around in mid-air. Since this is a top-down controller, this shouldn't be a problem since top-down games usually don't have platforms or jumping. But if you want to add gravity, you can check out my tutorial on making an FPS controller with the new input system, as it is very similar. Another problem is that the camera doesn't follow the player right now, so let's fix that. To make the camera follow the player, we will be using Cinemachine. Cinemachine is a suite of tools which gives us advanced control over cameras in our scene, all without having to write any code. It works using what it calls virtual cameras, which you can just think of as cameras for now, and a Cinemachine brain, which determines what virtual camera to render from. If that was confusing, don't worry about it, as it will hopefully make sense once we implement it. Again, Cinemachine does not come by default with new projects, so go to the package manager, search for Cinemachine, and install it. Again, you will see that I pre-installed it on this project. Pause the video while it is installing and come back once it's done. With it installed, you will see a new option in the toolbar at the top for Cinemachine. Select it and create a new virtual camera. I'm just going to call this virtual 
camera. If we click on the main camera now and scroll down in the inspector, you will see that a Cinemachine brain has automatically been added to it. Now we can return back to the virtual camera and see what options we have here. First off is the follow offset. This is how far away we want the camera to be from the player. By default, I'll set this the same as what we had at the start, so x to 0, y to 12, and z to negative 7. You will also notice that the camera is facing straight forward, so make sure to set its rotation on the x to 60. To make these errors go away, we can select our player and drag it into the follow slot, meaning that this virtual camera will follow our player at this offset distance away. I'm also going to increase its field of view since it's a bit short for me. So expand the lens tab and I'm going to set this to 60. For the aim, you'll see that we are still receiving an error. And this is because we want the camera to always have the same rotation and not look at the player. So I'll set the aim to do nothing. If I hit play now, you'll see that the camera automatically follows the player and also with some nice damping. You can edit the damping using these sliders here, X, Y, and Z, and if they are all down to zero, you will see that the camera follows the player exactly, and the higher up they are, the more damping they will be. Damping just refers to how quickly the camera will follow the player. I like the default settings, so I'm going to leave them all at one for now but you can of course use any value that you would like to. Just to demonstrate, if I change something like the X damping to 3 and the Y damping to 2, just because I like it like that, and then exit play mode, you'll notice that they all revert back to 1. However, if I check save during play, then hit play again, I can play the game and tweak the values to my liking while, as I play. And once I'm happy with it, I can exit play mode and those variables will retain their values. That's the end of this tutorial. If you found it helpful, remember to smash like and subscribe because it really motivates me to keep putting out more content like this. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.